Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Happy to see you. The, the Atheist Experience is live December 14th, 2003. I'm your host, Martin Wagner, Ashley Perrion, my co host, as always. This show is sponsored by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday morning at Hot Chumbo Bagels, which is located downtown at 307 West 5th Street between Guadalupe and La Vaca, except for the first Sunday of every month when we have our lecture series in the mayor's room of the Austin History Center, which is downtown at 9th and Guadalupe. Uh, now, for the first weekend in January, I don't believe we're actually having a lecture. It's going to be a business meeting. and That's correct. Also, there is a correction to all of that. Mm. Um, starting in January, we could not get the room at the time that we had it in the History Center. So our lectures will be moving to the third Sunday of the month. Ah. And we'll be having the larger of the two rooms. We're in the mayor room, which is a smaller one right at the side. The one that we're going to have is right next door, but it's about twice the size. It has three times as many chairs in there, so we can have much larger things. Oh, great. It's a third Sunday of every month. And that's starting in January? Uh, yes. So, But then, I, I don't think we have a lecture set up for January. Right, but then, so uh, why are we meeting the first Sunday of January? Is it The first Sunday of January, uh, we don't know. That's like a, that's like the second. Oh, and so we may not. We be might having, not even be. Doing, we may not yeah. have, be having a meeting. Period. All right, but because everybody be all we're not positive. Yeah. 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 Then we'll tell right. you in like a week when it's a week away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. So then uh, I stand corrected. Will be the um, lectures our third Sunday of every month now. Yes. Interesting. And also next week, um, the bagel. Why don't shop, you just do all this? I'm just here. here. <laughs> <laughs> the bagel shop is going to be closed on the 21st, yeah. which is this upcoming Sunday. Uh, we're going to say going to be meeting at Halcyon, which is right around the corner from it on 4th and Lavaca. Okay. Um, it used to be Rudamaya? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So we'll be there next week. Oh, interesting. So. Okay, cool. Well, now you know. That's it for my announcements. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, because they're, they're more accurate than mine, evidently. So, Okay, well, uh, other ACA meetings, uh, we'll get togethers, at least as far as I know. Uh, uh, remain <laughs> Godless Gamers, <laughs> which is uh, Monday night at the home of Russell and Virginia Glasser at uh, 7 p.m. And ACA Happy Hour is at Antonio's Tex-Mex, which is a Thursday evening get-together uh, around 7.30-ish. Antonio's Tex-Mex is located at uh, near the intersection of Highway 183 and I-35 on the southbound feeder road. And people tend to trickle in all evening long. Uh, so uh, you know, if you don't see anyone there right at 7.30, hang loose, because people will turn up and look for the very loud table with the uh, <laughs> fish on it and what else have you. Uh, now, again, I don't know with uh, these the holidays coming up if how Antonio's um, you know, um, schedule will be affected, but um, that I know of this Thursday, yeah, you know, it'll, haven't they'll, heard be, anything, but... they'll be open. So, okay. The Nonprofits, our biweekly internet audio show at the AtheistNetwork.com website. It plays every other Saturday at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, AtheistNetwork.com, it's a, a live MP3 stream, or if you just want to visit our website at atheist-community.org and click on the radio show page, uh, Russell has thoughtfully provided a direct link to the live feed from that page as well. Um, next episode will be this coming Saturday. I, is every other Saturday. I, did yes. say, I didn't yep. say Sunday. I didn't say anything. My, yep. Every other nothing. Saturday. Okay. I, I this upcoming to, Saturday. Good. All right. I need you to like watchdog <laughs> me here on these things in case because the old brain could just... All right. But uh, So it's every other Saturday. Uh, hosted by Jeff D., uh, Russell Glasser, and whoever else happens to turn up, whatever guests they have. It's uh, 90 minutes of news analysis and uh, arguing back and forth on lots of different subjects. There's an interactive, uh, there's a live sort of a JavaScript chat room feature that you can uh, interact with the show. And uh, if you visit our website and go to the radio show page, you can hear uh, about the uh, like last half dozen or so episodes as MP3s. Um, the nonprofits, biweekly, <clears throat> on the Internet. So don't miss it. And the University Atheists and Agnostics, I might have just wrapped up their third semester um, at the University of Texas. This is a registered UT student organization uh, for atheists and agnostics. So the first really successful one that uh, has been around. Uh, so I guess there'll be, um, so I guess the meetings there, the Friday afternoon 4 p.m. meetings in Garrison 200 uh, aren't happening anymore because the semester's done. Or at least, you know, they're in finals and struggling with that. So uh, as soon as we know, uh, how things are shaping up for the spring semester and where the meetings are going to be held and everything, of course, we will let you know. And, of course, you can visit our website right there, bottom of your monitor, studentorgs.utexas.edu slash UAA for information about the group. If you are a registered UT student or faculty member and also an atheist or agnostic and you would like a group to uh, hook up with and meet some like-minded folks, they're the ones to meet. So, UAA. 
All right. Uh, just for more information about uh, the organization, ACA, uh, visit atheist-community.org on the web. It's got a lot of uh, interesting stuff about there, uh, you know, uh, past events, uh, current events that we're involved in. Um, and there is also a very help- helpful uh, fact page, Frequently Asked Questions. This show, if you're just tuning in and seeing it for the first time ever, uh, we've been on the air for uh, pretty close to seven years now. It'll be seven years next month. Okay. And... Um, I don't know if it was like entirely regular for the first year yeah, or two. But, I, uh, I have um, no idea. But uh, the uh, the fact has been assembled uh, as a result of pretty much all the most common questions that we get on this program from Christians and other religious viewers, the questions opposed to atheists. But um, So if you've never seen our show before and you're thinking about calling us up, check our fact page because we may have already answered your question. But if not, this is a live call-in show. Uh, we'll be here for uh, the next 90 minutes regaling you with our blasphemy. And uh, we're happy to have you. We have lots of fun, interesting conversations. Uh, but if you don't get a chance to call in, which happens, uh, the calls do tend to get backed up. And usually at the end of the show, there's usually a few folks waiting, hanging online. We have got uh, a viewer uh, feedback address at tv at atheist-community.org. And that is uh, your viewer feedback address to ask us questions. And, uh, you know, we answer every email we get. And, uh, you know, the, if there's a really humdinger one, we'll bring it on the air and read it out loud and talk about it. And uh, so, and we thanks a lot for all of the, uh, the feedback that we get. We get a lot of really good letters. Um, got a letter last week. Uh, you know, some, some folks are sort of um, kind of giving us high fives for the way we just put up with the occasional abusive call oh. <laughs> that we tend to get, you know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, like, like last week we got um, – Couple people who were just off the handle and were, yeah. were just slinging profanities at us left, yeah. right, and center. Yeah. They were just sort of like, you know, whatever, y'all. And um, <laughs> that's I, the depth of their arguments. Yeah, you know, and uh, some, uh, you know, some folks. Uh, actually, some folks from our group kind of wrote us this saying, "I don't see how you guys just uh, <laughs> put up with it, <laughs> shrug that stuff off so easily." It's like, you know, it's 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 not hard when the net result of a phone call like that. Is that two Christians immediately call the program yes. to apologize profusely yeah. for those people? Which sort of <laughs> figures like you know that just puts us right in the winter circle. So um, I've never understood the the mentality behind this this idea that uh, some people seem to have that uh, if they call us up and and they like act real nasty, yeah, that that hurts us somehow. Yeah, that they're going to somehow win this argument by just being rude, or, or just rude. are like they they think that so. we're the ones who are made look. To look bad by yeah. their behavior, just, no, <laughs> doesn't hurt us at all. Yeah. I mean, you can call us whatever you want, right? But we're here to actually have like intelligent discussions with people, and um, we like to hear from people who disagree with us. And you know, if you disagree with us, and you have a, a point good, to the show, yeah, if you have a good argument, I mean, a lot of a lot of shows, right? Especially ones that are like for a lot of religious programming, yeah, you know, like on uh, radio and what have you, they really don't like it when atheists call up and yeah. challenge them. They'll hang up right on you. But we, we're not like that. We love to hear from people who disagree with us, but. If you disagree with us, call us up and engage us in a debate and an argument and give us your points and let's have a back and forth, you know. But if you can't handle that, you know, then just don't watch, okay? You know, um, because you don't hurt us. Uh, You can call us whatever you want, but we're more interested in in talking to folks and having a good time, okay? Because this show is a good time. So uh, that pretty much takes care of it. So don't forget, tv at atheist-community.org, your viewer feedback address. So... Without further ado, uh, before we um, head towards the calls, it's time for the news with Ashley. What is going on in the world besides, you know, all the, the good news from overseas this morning? Quite a bit. Ah, yes. Yes. Yeah. That too. Very good news. So, um, okay. First one, local news, though. Uh, right. We had the story. This was July of last year. Uh, Joshua and Caleb Thompson um, oh. were a couple youth pastors at a church in South Austin. Um, one of the kids that under their supervision was, you know, goofing off in Bible class, cheating on his studies and whatnot. Uh, they took him out back, held him down. One of them held him down. The other one beat him with a tree branch over a hundred times. His kidneys nearly gave out. Um, and then they took him back home, gave him back to the parents and said, you know, you should continue beating him. He's, he's, he's just not under control yet. Um, I still just reel it's, in awe. When it, it, it's that. absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. It's absolutely so, incredible. Um, all, but anyway, that was a year and a half ago. Um, they went to trial just a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. That's over with now. Um, and let me see. Has been sentenced to 26 years, uh, the pastor, wow. for injury to a child and 20 years for aggravated assault. 
His brother, who was also convicted of his, for his role in the beating, received 14 years each on the same charges. <sighs> wow. Now, well, again, yeah, you, five. Yeah. you kind of expect defense attorneys in this kind of case to obviously, you know, try and get it lessened and, you know, put their own spin Well, they're going to appeal, but, I'm sure. Right? Oh, yeah, they, they have yeah. said that they're going to appeal. But, uh, of course, their quotes right after this comes out. <laughs> this is a witch hunt, said defense attorney Carlos Garcia, who represented Caleb Thompson. They are being persecuted. Uh, defense attorney Van Hilly, who uh, represents... Okay, fine, yeah. If you, <laughs> if you beat the holy hell out of a kid with a tree branch so that he gets kidney failure... Yeah, we're going to yeah, persecute you. Yeah, expect to be persecuted. Yep. <laughs> um, during closing arguments Thursday, Joshua hmm. and Caleb should receive probation because being convicted felons uh. is punishment, punishment enough. No, it isn't. Joshua Thompson's other defense attorney agreed. The whole country knows about them. Uh, send a message to everyone that we tempered our justice with compan with compassion. Uh, they didn't show. Uh, they didn't they temper didn't their show justice. A bit of compassion to, to that eleven year old kid that they beat a hundred times with a tree branch. Yeah, where was their tempering of justice? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, just astonishing. So, you yeah. Know? Uh, persecutors had recommended thirty year sentences in their closing yeah. arguments. Yeah, uh, well, I'm glad Hopefully they're seeing you know, in the, the appeal. It will go up to thirty. <laughs> yeah. So, just for the smart-ass comments yeah. by the defense. Yeah. So, defense is so. fined. Uh, was that Blackadder <laughs> episode? Defense is fined a thousand pounds for even showing up. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so. just amazing, just uh, you know, people. Yeah. yeah, and then and then lawyers whine that people think they're all sleazy and scummy. And <laughs> you you like, kind of wonder why. Uh, um, anyway, Andy's not here today because she'd smack us around a bit. But uh, <laughs> but that is just you know that's that's yeah. just defense attorneys. You know, the, the, there's just seems like sometimes there's no depth to which they won't stoop. Yeah. yeah. To uh, you know. So. So anyway, that is the good news. Yeah, uh, so they're going up the river. 26 and 20 years. Yeah. So that's nice good. long yeah. time. Now that sends a message, yeah. okay? Yeah. The, the this message is not probation, going to be tolerated. Yeah, we don't like, uh, probation sends messages of beat a kid half to death and we'll slap your wrist and send you home to do it again. Yeah. That's the message that sends. That's not a good message. Yeah. Throwing, him in, throwing you in jail for a quarter century is a good message. <laughs> so, but you know what? The, the Bush administration will probably put some big, like, Christian get out of jail free program in there and the brothers will end up leading it and being like the Very minister possibly. of the cell get block off after three months for good behavior yeah be so. the minister of the cell block and they'll get a you know like a key to their cell which was happening in one jail yeah. in michigan which was unreal so yeah, yeah. yeah. but i don't know <laughs> uh, now i you don't want to get too cynical all right i'll just bask in the glow of you know i'll just pretend a that justice a little bit of justice has been yeah. served um, oh well good for that Okay, <sighs> off of that now, onto science for a little while. Science! Um, this is one, actually, the, about nanotechnology also. Oh. Magnetized nanoparticles may one day be the treatment of choice for people needing to detox, whether they be a soldier in the field contaminated by anthrax or a civilian who has partied way too hard <laughs> suffering from a drug overdose. <laughs> The nanoparticles designed at uh, Argonne National Laboratory come fitted with receptors designed to identify and then latch on to target molecules. The nano nanoparticles are injected into the bloodstream where they circulate through the body, picking up target toxins as they go. So essentially what it sounds like is this little device, essentially, mm -hmm. partly made of metal. It's got a receptor on it to pick up, you know, whatever kind of chemical they're searching for. They inject this into your bloodstream. It latches on all, all the target, all, all of what they're looking just for, sort of essentially. And they essentially just hook a, hook a magnet up to your arm. It all gets sucked to that part of your body eventually, and then you just pull it out, and there you go. Pull it out. Um, That's just weird. I mean, so. Like, what comes out? This globule of goo? It's like, <laughs> well, essentially, what, what they just, do is in, in one of your arm or your leg yeah. arteries, they, they put a shunt in there, uh -huh. which is essentially a tube within, within a tube, and the blood is filtered through that. It's magnetized. Uh -huh. The particles stick to that, uh -huh. and then they can pull that out. Yeah, wow. So, so essentially, it's just big gummed up mass that they just pull out and you know burn. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, but like I said, I mean, it, it's cool. From what they're making it sound like, it sounds like it's this one piece <laughs> that's put in there. Science you put on the receptor, whatever you need. Life easier for addicts so. everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Uh. <laughs> but uh, wow, but no, it's I mean, just it, amazing. Though, yeah, the, it, it's. The, it's vaguely similar. To, uh, they mentioned to hemodialysis, which uh -huh. essentially they pump a liter or two of blood out. You know, in, in normal circulation, filter that and then pump it back in. Yeah, that's what Keith Richards um, usually does. Exactly. Every Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but now the trouble they can with do that, it more. 
technologically yeah. advanced. And also that they they can only uh, filter out very specific kind of toxins. Mm. It's it's pretty limited what they can do with that. And also it's really expensive. It's really big. It's mm. really time consuming. So you have to be really rich to exactly exactly. Okay. They, this one's a portable little unit, and they can do it in forty minutes. Ooh. So, and it should be a wow. lot cheaper. So oh, yeah. So that's some um, and like and like I say since they can make it for many much more things uh, autoimmune disorder they're talking about here rheumatoid arthritis also. Oh, wow. They could do the yeah. same things, possibly. Carpal tunnels. So, like yeah. So they might be able to do that. Very so. cool. So that would be kind of Well, neat. yeah. I mean, I know that, uh, you're, you know, nanotechnologies are what are being looked at yeah. for some really advanced, yeah. uh, not just life extension technologies, but just good medications for things like arteriosclerosis. And, and, exactly. You know, just, just have these little, you know, micro machines swimming around in your bloodstream, yeah. you know, cleaning crap out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's... Uh, yeah. Well, this is one where Science it looks fiction like it 20 years ago. may actually happen. So far, they've been testing it on rats, and it's been doing fairly well. Right. Um, Food and Drug Administration trials should start within five years. So Awesome. Still a little ways off, but yeah. on the way, hopefully. Yes. Good. So. so. Okay. Yet more science. Uh, this time, fossils. Oh. We've touched on them several times. Uh, the fossil of a tiny creature found in northeast China is helping scientists determine when animals split into different groups. Though with those with babies develop inside their mothers and those that raise their offspring in pouches. Uh, the two groups make up more than 99% of all mammals today, and the new fossil evidence indicates the separation in Asia about 125 million years ago. Uh, the new found ancient animal named Sinodelphus uh, Zalea, Zalei, Okay. Uh, is the earliest known marsupial, meaning an animal with a pouch. Mm -hmm. uh, chipmunk size, about six inches long and weighed about an ounce. Right. Uh, its skeleton was found in 2000 in a region where researchers had previously found a fossil believed to be the earliest known placental animals of the same age. Hmm. So, so yeah, that split between marsupials and you know non-marsupial mammals, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, now down to about 125 million years in that kind of range. So, wow. um, I'd like to know how they can tell some of this stuff from a fossil, though, because that is definitely yeah. soft tissue. Now, I don't know if there's skeletal differences, um, because apparently be. they're giving birth to a much earlier in development creature, okay. and that would then just ate in the pouch. And yeah. so, possibly by having such having much smaller young, there could be much you know smaller cavities in the hip bones or whatnot. Yeah, I mean that would so. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's it's got to be just uh, you so, know looking at the different because yeah yeah you know, I mean you can you can tell just human gender just by looking at the skeleton yeah, yeah. a trained person can so yeah. Um, yeah it makes sense that you could then you could probably just deduct more from yeah. okay with this kind of bone structure you're looking at this kind of body yeah most likely gonna have a pouch or most likely not yeah so but huh, that's intriguing so again getting more of these so-called transitional forums in place exactly. filling in some of the gaps filling in uh, some of the gaps of our knowledge yeah right. getting timelines down science marches bit. on i mean you know it's uh, an yeah. amazing thing always changing always learning new stuff yeah. so. all right and the final one okay back to religion you can do more than that i mean it's just it's whatever well, i'll just back to religion uh, -huh. uh let's see this is uh, policing crackles with buzzwords now nowadays, from zero tolerance to on-the-spot fines. The power of prayer is an unlikely addition to that list, but it could be effective against uh, it could be an effective weapon in the battle against crime. Uh, he is, according to Canteen culture, John the Baptist. Uh, okay. That was a nickname of John Sutherfield, who was a uh, who got the uh, nickname John Sutherfield got as a young policeman. Okay, now where's this? Taking place? Uh, this, I believe, is all in England. Okay. Um, they don't have the actual city or anything here, but okay. it, it's in England. It's from the BBC News. Okay. Um, I believe in the power of prayer and the person of Jesus, he says. In terms of my fight against crime as a police officer, I believe we are capable of having an impact on a pra in a practical way. If you take an individual burglar and pray for him and he becomes a Christian, one of the net impacts of that is that he may stop burgling. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may stop burgling. Maybe. Okay. It's not a guarantee. He may, it's but he may not. Yes, it's a, it's a maybe. So then you, why, why even do it, right? Because <laughs> it seems like yeah. you know, he may or he may not anyway, right? Yeah, and apparently, uh, I don't know, maybe they just hold him down and pray over him. <laughs> um, 
Each month, each month, Mr. Th- Sutherfield compiles a list of crime issues in the borough he polices. Hammersmith and Fulham in West London. Huh. West London. Okay. Well, that's the um, nice part of London. Yeah. He then emails the list around to more than 150 churchgoers in the borough asking for their prayers and for those specific issues, be they a reduction in levels of street co- crime or the arrest of a particularly prolific housebreaker. The December prayer list being sent out on Wednesday includes a <laughs> prayer for people's houses to be safe between now and the new year. Christmas can be a favorite time for burglars. Okay. Uh, there have been. So what will happen if so? So so what if someone gets burgled in that time? Okay. Well, that apparently their house wasn't prayed for. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We'll say that one we didn't pray for. Sorry, yeah. missed that one. Yeah. Their uh, shield of prayer was yeah. listed. Lifted. Yeah. Their colon. <laughs> their colander of protection. Mm-hmm. Um, but doesn't don't don't doesn't this guy understand that when he says something like this, right? He's making a testable claim. Yes. It's like this is an excellent way. Okay, let's go ahead and test the efficacy of this. Yeah. Why don't we say, okay, um, let's pick a specific crime, you know, like yeah. uh, you know, aggravated assault. Yeah. And let's just pray that yeah. this doesn't happen uh, ever, like for an entire year on yeah. you know even numbered days. <laughs> okay. Okay. And if you can, because that is that would that would be evidence of a specific. It, it doesn't even random, need to pure, be that. Random, pure randomness wouldn't generate yeah. something that. It, it doesn't even have to be that precise. You yeah. could still get, again, look at the results. You know how many you know of this type of crime happened over the over the in the course of a year for mm-hmm. the last twenty years, mm-hmm. fifty years, whatever whatever your records records for. Mm-hmm. You've got a variation in there. You know it normally jumps up by five, down by ten, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So if you pray for it not to happen this year, if you can get a stig- statistically significant reduction, then that's fine. Something apparently has happened where the numbers have gone down. And so now is that the can prayer? You, now can you happened? make the causal connection, right? Exactly. Is it actually the prayer and therefore God intervening saying, don't do that? Mm-hmm. Or is it just, you know, church attendance is higher? Or, you know, the community is now more informed that, mm-hmm. you know, we've had 500 break-ins every year for the last 20 years. Oh, no, I'm going to lock my doors now. Exactly. I'm going to lock my doors. Yeah. My God, that, that guy who's walking the streets <laughs> looks a little bit suspicious. Maybe yeah. I'll call the police on him. Yeah, be a little more alert. Exactly. Yeah. As soon as people have knowledge, they may start acting on that knowledge. Sure. It yeah. may not be the prayer and God's almighty power doing it because God's yeah. almighty power could stop it immediately mm-hmm. to zero. Because, I, yeah, because if you are going to start in, evoking these supernatural you know, yeah. uh, means to say, okay, well, we're going to solve problems this way. Yes. Then I, ex- then again, that's an extraordinary claim. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I expect something a little bit higher than just something that would be statistically significant. Okay. You know, it, it really should be something rather groundbreaking. It should be something <laughs> like, wow, we didn't get yeah, any single one of this crime for this year. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it went down to from like whatever percentage it was to zero percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the next year we didn't pray that prayer at all. And then the crime went back up. <laughs> Maybe yeah. now there's, you know, you can start drawing some sort of causality there. But uh... but again, this all <laughs> begs the question: uh-huh. What happened for the previous twenty years? <laughs> did God either a choose not to do anything because uh-huh. people aren't praying hard enough, or did He not know about it and say, "Oh damn, I just forgot about Fullerham. I'm sorry." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and so what yeah. was going on for the previous twenty years? He's been letting all this stuff go on. Yeah, well, I mean, the whole notion is silly, right? Because, of course, um, if, if God is some perfect being, right? Yeah. Okay, then, then God would not be, I mean, uh, prayer is useless, okay, in terms of trying to make some entreaty of a perfect being, yeah. right? I mean, you know, a, a perfect being, quite frankly, would not be moved by the prayers of, of yeah. imperfect, you know, mortal, flawed individuals. You yeah. know, and that, and that has nothing to do with hubris. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with, you know, this being being some sort of, you know, unreasonable tyrant or anything. Yeah. It's just that if you're perfect, right? Which every Christian will tell you God is okay. That means you lack for nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and you know, there's it, there's really just <laughs> no benefit to you, yeah. uh, and there's no real need yeah. to be satisfying. You what know, kind the of ego, What kind of ego problem do you have that yeah. you need to be worshipped? Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but the thing, but also, but but if this God is this loving being and didn't want these things to be going on, then they wouldn't be going on. Yeah. Right. You yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, so. Uh, more anyway. examples that they have there. There had been a killing, and there was a fear of reprisals, he said. Uh-huh. So people were asked to pray simply that there would be no more violence. 
and there was no more violence. Yeah, because everybody was not And John praying for saw no, that right? it was good, and <laughs> it was so. Yeah. Um, next, he asked for his network to pray that there should be a significant reduction in street crime. Um, towards the end of the summer, he says, street crime started to come down. Uh, while his prayer list does highlight answers to prayers, such as a 4% drop in street crime alle- uh, mm. oh, allegations. A 4%? 4%. Wow. Well, that's, uh, yeah. That's um, supernatural to me. Yeah. God controls 4% of street crime. Mm. Or he can stop 4%. Hey, um, you, come back here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> he miss, did, miss that one. I know. He ran yeah. too quickly. That's, um, that's going to go from 5% down to 4% because of <laughs> just... <laughs> Uh, they they uh, do point out in here, though, an experiment earlier this year into whether prayer does have concrete results may have disappointed believers. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a study run by Duke University Medical okay. Center in North okay. Carolina involved prayers being said for half a group of 750 hospital patients. Okay. A um, whole bunch of religious people prayed over them. Researchers found no difference in the recovery rates of the two groups. Right. So Let's see what happens. So, yeah, just okay. say hospital or street crime. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, prayer is, is it's it's there to to give believers something to you know. Just, of course, something to, to do. Well, it's you know, it's it, it, busy it, work. Yeah, it makes it makes it feel good. Makes you feel like you're solving a problem and what have you. And okay, so uh, we we've had some callers call in, and uh, you know, so, um, and we'll we'll definitely get to you. So if you've tried to call us and we're like, Ooh, they're going on too long. No, please call us back. We're at a, you know just four seven seven two two eight eight. It's a number to call and. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Bridget on one. Hey, Bridget, how you doing? Hi. This is my first time calling, and yes, I think ma'am. this is a very interesting uh, show. Oh, thank you. Thank I you. want to ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. I, I wanted to know, what exactly do atheists believe in? Okay, well, it could be any number of things, right? Uh, um, okay. Atheism specifically refers to uh, you know what you don't believe. And an atheist, uh, if you're an atheist, it's because you don't believe in any gods. Now, beyond that... Beyond that um, uh, atheists, I've I've heard adopting any number of different sort of philosophies. There are conservative atheists, liberal atheists, uh, objectivist atheists. Um, uh, so it really uh, above and beyond that, it, it's it's just down to the individual. Uh, so, but mo- most atheists, as a rule, I think tend, you know, to look at more uh, practical and uh, sort of humanistic outlooks on life. You know, they they had they adopt those sorts of outlooks on life much more so than anything that you might call spiritual or. Or what have you? I mean, the philosophies tend to be more more grounded in, um, you know, not uh, not too many not too many uh, new age yeah. atheists or anything like that who yeah. believe in you know the the power of you know mm, it's, it's crystals the, or you know so. or just you know the universe is looking out for us or anything yeah. like that. So it did. So. Okay, you guys are pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to know: Do you pray okay. in any type of manner at all? Pray nope. any praying at all? No, ma'am. No. no. Okay. Not, okay. not not in the way that normal people would, you know, say, you know, please God, let me, you know, pass this test or whatever. Um, it's it's much more, you know, it's just an internal dialogue, kind of discussing things out with myself, you know, wondering what's going to happen. Yeah, that's not praying. That's it, a, yeah, it's not exactly praying. It's it, internal dialogue. Yeah. yeah. It, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, if, if praying, if, if you if you if you define praying as sort of uh, you know entreating some divine being to uh, to grant you some kind of favor or what have you, you no know, atheists don't do that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, um, what is your explanation for all of us being here on the Earth? What ah, is- well, that's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, usually, I mean, what? Oh, okay, neither Ashley nor I are scientists professionally. We don't do that for a living. So uh, the best we can do is tell you that uh, what the prevailing theories are, and there are a number of them. And um, as to how why, why there are people on the Earth... Uh, uh, once again, I mean, we know that there are uh, very common organic molecules uh, out there just in the universe. They're very common around hot young stars. Uh, organic molecules could have been just part of the primordial soup that were on this planet. And when the climatic conditions got to where they were, you know, right to kind of develop the way they develop, you know, we, en- we ended up, our, our life ended up, you know, the very, the very earliest forms of life on, on a micro- microbial phase, you know, got started and uh, over... A long, long time kind of developed into where we are now. Uh, you know, I, that's not any anything in the way of an expert explanation, grant you. <laughs> okay. But um, you know, overall, it it appears to be natural processes, and there's evidence that we might we might we might see those natural processes at work in other areas of our solar system. Now, there's uh, pretty there are pretty good arguments to be made that um, I think one of Jupiter's moons uh, might might be ideal. The conditions there for very early you know, microbial life, 
uh, like uh, what was exi- what was on our planet, you know, four billion years ago. Uh, we don't know that for certain, uh, but it's worth investigating. There still could be areas of patches on Mars where there are microbes, and who knows what uh, what other worlds out there elsewhere in the universe have forms of life that we don't really know anything about. Uh, but if the conditions uh, are right for the development of life and the uh, you know the um, you know, and, and all of the molecules are there in the soup to do what molecules do, um, the odds of getting life really aren't all that uh, inconceivable. So, But the real answer to your question is, of course, that no one actually knows, right? We just have theories, and we have uh, um, you know, a great deal of knowledge and research yet to be done, but that's what kind of makes it all exciting. That's what makes science a very exciting uh, discipline, that there are always new things to learn around the corner. So have you always believed this, or did your belief change over the years? Well, I was raised in the church, and I was raised in the Baptist church, and um, um, but I, I eventually, you know, relinquished my religious beliefs just for any number of reasons. Ashley, I think you did. Yeah. You grow up in a religious? Uh, yes, I grew up religious. I uh-huh. went to church every week, but science was always something that was just kind of interesting. And so, you know, I've, uh-huh. I've read about you know cosmology and evolution, all that kind of stuff, since I was really young. So I never believed that you know God just poofed us into existence. Um, again, I've studied a little bit more in depth recently. Um, in the last couple of years, um, I used to be, I, I wouldn't say religious, but of the opinion that, you know, other people who went to church had this, you know, big experience out of it and they were so happy and they were just so content with their lives and everything. And I just wasn't feeling any of that when I came out of church. And so I figured, you know, okay, you know, maybe Christianity isn't got, doesn't have it quite right. Maybe Buddhism doesn't have it quite right. But apparently so many people are religious. There must be something going on out there. And, you know, I just don't get it yet. Uh, now, after hearing the arguments, no, I think that a lot of people are just, you know, getting the happy feelings out of, you know, the social aspects of it, having, you know, something that they do with their lives. Yeah. I mean, religion it's, does provide that, you know, yeah, a sense of community. It's not a supernatural and, God that's doing yeah. it. It's having a good group of friends. Yeah. So. That's, uh, but. So. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time. <laughs> sure. Sure. And call okay. us back anytime. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Oh, that was interesting. Uh, oh, here's another fun. Matt. Matt, hi. How y'all doing today? We're hey. okay. Uh, what's up? Well, nothing. I actually had a question. I, I wanted to know, is this something that y'all do uh, full-time, or do y'all actually have careers or jobs outside of this? This is just our weekend thing that we do. I'd love to get paid thing? for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to make a, you know, something to have the uh, yeah. nationwide atheist cable network, and we do this show uh, every, but nah. No. Uh, what this is just our volunteer thing we do. you ball got? Hmm? What level of education you both got? Uh, well, uh, let's see. I've got a I've got a bachelor's in RTF. What about yourself? Uh, bachelor's in economics. Not all that relevant, but still yeah. works. You yeah. both, are you boys buddies from school? Are you you lovers or, or what, what's the story with, with you two? <laughs> no. Well, no, nah, we're, we're just we're just pals. So, you know, that's just the uh, way that is. You know, is, is that is that pal, something that you have an issue with? Benefit. Is that uh, is that something you have an issue with there? Uh, yes, somewhat. Yeah. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> okay. Well, I, and, <laughs> I figured we'll s- that the guy on the left looks like a big packer with a beard. Yeah. Well, t- you wish. <laughs> See, <laughs> you know, I don't understand why guys like you think that you can call the show and talk like that, and that hurts us. Okay. I mean, that just makes you look like yeah, where you the are. You're the one that looks like the moron here. Yeah. You know, we just sit there and go. <laughs> See, look at the kind of people who you know call us up. <laughs> so, okay. Hi, too. You're on the air. Hi. Yeah, I have a comment for Ashley. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I, I, like, I'm like, um, I'm into atheists and stuff. Like, I want to know more about it and stuff. Like, yeah. Such but, as. Uh, okay. Like what? Like, um. Kind of an open-ended question there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't believe really in nothing, really. Hmm. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a drag. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but I, I've been watching our show and like I love it and stuff. I, I am one of those FBU guys too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Be one. You start announcing it. That gets yeah, real easy. I mean, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So many. Uh, oh, the um, yeah. There's uh, what is it? Uh, in a long cosmological discussion, right? There was the um, uh, the fellow who uh, wrote us a few weeks ago um, talking about. The anthropic principle. Yes. And yes, yes. And there are uh, interesting discussions that you will hear 
uh, that follow along that argument, more or less uh, along the lines of, uh, okay, if the universe is sort of here for us to observe and the conditions are such that we're here to observe it, then we're here to observe it, which must have meant that, you know, if we weren't here to observe it, what would be the point? Therefore, there must have been some intent yeah. in having yeah. life forms like us yeah. here to observe the universe that's around us. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of like saying, you know, that, imagine if you have like a puddle of water, right? And it's sitting in this hole in the ground. Yeah. And the puddle of water is thinking to itself, I mean, check this hole out. This hole is like perfect for us. Perfectly designed for that puddle of water. Yeah, it's like exactly my shape, yeah. this hole. <laughs> How convenient. Yeah. <laughs> the fact is that we've adapted to fit our environment. Uh, and it can certainly seem, I, you know, I understand why when people want to discuss about, okay, well, you know, how do we, how do we get here and where do we come from and, and what's it all about, that you would apply just human levels of understanding to that because you understand, okay, yeah. well, people make stuff that yeah. has a function, yeah. okay? You know, it serves a function for our use. And so it's natural that you would sort of apply that thinking just to the universe at large yeah. since it makes sense that the things we make have a function and, yeah. have, and, and there's an intent there, and that they're useful to us because we make them that way, yeah. you know, then why not understand the rest of the yeah. universe like that? And it's very difficult for people. Um, well, I like the analogy to, that came up of the pair of glasses. You know, people uh -huh. say, our noses were so perfectly designed yeah. to fit the pair of glasses. <laughs> you, know, you got it backwards. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, it's, to, to just say, well, I mean, it's, to hard, it's very hard not to just kind of apply that uh, projection of yourself. Yeah. Onto the rest of the universe, right. um, and there is a, was a really interesting article in uh, the most recent Free Inquiry about uh, the sort of the, this anthropic arrogance of religion. Yeah. It's also like this whole idea that it's it's made for us. Yeah, you know, is is kind of you know egomania gone wild, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's natural that that would be the first conclusion that people would jump to. But yeah. you know, once you kind of distance yourself from it and look at it a little bit more objectively, that there are other ways to look at things. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem that a lot of religious people have is that you know what they want good, hard, concrete answers. Religion gives them that. Science doesn't really give them that. Science basically says, well, this is the best we can talk. This yeah. is the best conclusion that we can reach yeah. based on the evidence at this time. Yeah. And so that's a hard time. Uh, okay. Um, Jim is on one. Hey, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call and enjoying the show. Oh, thank you. Um, what do you think is one of the primary stereotypes for being an atheist? Baby eater. <laughs> Well, I haven't heard that one. Uh, well, just, you know, uh, um, there, well, the, I think the primary stereotype is that you are, um, that uh, you're amoral and um, generally unhappy. You know, people think that yeah. if you don't believe in God, it's usually because some bad thing happened to you. Yeah. You're and an old that, curmudgeon. Yeah, you don't, it's not that you don't believe in God. It's that, you're, that, God, that something really bad has happened to you and you're angry at God for letting it happen. So yeah. you're rebelling. It's, or it's almost like you're a re rebellious kid. Yeah. Sort yeah. of. A, it's like this phase that you're kind Defying of... Defying your parents. That's a very common one. Um, and a lot of these stereotypes our atheists are hit with, you know, uh, mainly by theists, so that, you know, theists can avoid actually uh, meeting their burden of proof for their claim of, you know, there's this God and he exists and he does stuff. Rather than having to do that, it's much easier to kind of respond to atheists who are asking you all these annoying questions by saying, well, no, look, it's, these guys have a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they just, so that's usually it. You know, there's, there's just something wrong with you that you're either unhappy, you're miserable, you're, you're antisocial, you're amoral. And, it's, and of course, none of it's true. You know, it's just, uh, atheists are just regular folks. Um, it's just, uh, we tend to not look at religious questions the same way that believers look at them. You know, we kind of demand harder answers and, and, uh, there are no sacred cows, you know, we insist upon an equal level of evidence right. for every claim, you know, the sort of, the sort of very strong evidence that you would expect, you know, a physicist or an astronomer or a biologist or, or, or any other, or any professional in any field of science to provide to kind of back up whatever theory he's got. You know, we ask the same thing of religion. And um, believers don't see it that way. They think kind of think religion ought to have a free pass yeah. in that regard. And we're like, well, no, why? But, uh, so I guess those are the most common ones. Anything I missed? Not that I know of, no. Okay. Again, it's just mostly that, that stereotype that you're just, you know, mm -hmm. really pissed off at the world and God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you talked a little bit about being considered immoral. Um, that's probably the one that I hear the most. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit, what's the humanist viewpoint on how morality developed? Um, was it because of religion? Could it have developed without religion? Uh, I, I, well, I think it all, all these things developed concurrently, right? I mean, uh, with the rise of civilization, you got... 
Oh, okay. I think he hung up. So. I mean, with the rise of civilization, you got all the institutions of yeah. civilization kind of rising at the same time. And um, I think religion sort of came about to <clears throat> not only have some sort of ruling class, yeah. you know, but then there was like this, the, you know, the priesthood who were basically the rulers. They were the government. Uh, they were the guys in charge. <clears throat> and when you're the guys in charge, you're going to like make laws and pass rules, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. but, but morality itself is, is kind of independent of that. It's just when civilization yeah. codified it and sort of came up with religion as a way of codifying yeah. these moral precepts that Why? actually arose, um, you're just, uh, through the same kind of natural evolutionary processes that everything else did. Yeah. Law right. is relatively recent in human history, and, mm. you know, evolution and such. Morals have been around for a long freaking time. Yeah. Um, because again, we're a social species. We live together. We have, you know, from mm. ancient times, we had to, you know, come up with rules that, okay, if we're going to have a whole bunch of people living together in the same area, mm. we've got to have some rules that there isn't just complete anarchy. Um, and then laws. And it was trial just, and error too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was yeah. a lot of, you know, didn't know exactly what to do, and so try different things out, and, well, that didn't work very well. <laughs> um, but if you so. want to go to the anthropological source of it and, and the evolutionary source of it, it's, it's, um, it had to do with the fact that Homo sapiens, and there, and there were a couple of other early hominid species, but our species specifically were very lucky because we developed big brains. Yeah. We had this nice, big, fat brain pan with a big old squishy brain in it. Okay? <laughs> it's not like other hominids. Like, like there yeah. was Homo erectus before us yeah that was physically a very large yeah you know being this was like you know like you know the males are commonly over six feet yeah. huge right yeah. but tiny brain yeah okay. dumber dumber than dirt yeah <laughs> very <laughs> tiny brain so um having a bigger brain homo sapiens were able to do uh, a couple of things they we uh developed language yeah you know and when you developed language um what you ended up with were cooperative Behaviors between yeah. other members of the species. And, uh, you know, you formed tribes. The tribes got together. And you were able to cooperate and say, all right, instead of just us all going around foraging and gathering nuts and berries, let's all get in a big gang and hunt down yeah. the big ox or yeah. the big elk or the big, yeah. you know, piece of game together. Yeah. And then we'll have all this food. <clears throat> and then as a result of that cooperation, then, of course, the, the moral precepts that we developed just came naturally from that. Yeah. You know, it was our way, <coughs> excuse me, in a dry throat. It was just how cooperating, it's like, okay, now that we're cooperating and now that our societies are getting bigger, now that the tribe is now a big clan, yeah. and now that the clan is a town, and now that the town is a city, yeah. we still have to keep these, we still have to keep figuring out ways to get along. And that's really sort of how it came about, you yeah. know. So, yeah, and all these things are natural, perfectly natural. So, all right, uh, line two. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. This is Juan. How are you doing? Just hey. fine, Juan. How are you doing? Fantastic. Here watching your show every chance I get. Mm, right. I got a couple of items today. Yes, sir. Uh, the first one, if you let me set it up, is um, in a few words, the seemingly aggressive uh, attitude of mm -hmm. the religious right towards um, accomplishing their goals by taking over the various parts of government, from the Supreme Court to Congress to the executive branch, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. so that they can cover all their bases and force religion on uh, Americans. That is the what I, I, it seems to me the the aggressive attitude they have versus the what I would call kind of a, a wimpy or non-aggressive attitude of the secular movement that was at its strongest point about, you know, when, the, the, when the, this nation was founded. You know, yeah. uh, when atheism was such a strong force that they established secular governments all over the world, except, you know, we know in, you know, in mm -hmm. Islam countries. Yeah. Uh, and little by little, the force of the secular movement or the atheist movement has come down to uh, a sort of a complacent attitude <laughs> towards the rise of this aggressive religious right. Um, I and don't know that I agree with you entirely, but I know anyway. I know that. Oh. I, that's why I'm <laughs> posing this question to you to okay. to see how your take on this particular issue. 
Okay. Where, yes, the secular people are in power. <laughs> Scientists are in power. The atheist movement won 200 years ago. The secular movement won 200 years ago and kept religion at bay. But little by little it has been growing, and we've seen it in the last, you know, 20 years, to the point where they are this close to taking over the Supreme Court. And uh, pretty soon, I mean, there are no guarantees that this country is going to remain secular. And, and, and you know, I, I, I am glad to hear news like, for example, the, 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 the court ruling, you know, putting those people 20 years in jail for beating a, a child, you know, that did not learn his religious lessons. But if we were, if these people take over, you're not going to see that. Oh, yes. See, we, okay. we, let, we let are, go. when I like to say we, yeah. when I talk about the atheist movement and the secular movement, we <laughs> are in power. And these people are inching up to take over our power, right. the power established over 200 years ago. Okay, let, 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 let me go ahead and start addressing some of this All stuff. All right. Here, okay. Um, Okay, first off, I don't, um, um, certainly the, the intent was, you know, with, with the founding of the country was to have the government itself be a secular institution. Um, and, and that had to do w with, you know, the recognition that a person's religious beliefs are their own business and that the government shouldn't be in the business of enforcing that. Because, again, the founding fathers had all come from Europe and they had seen thousands, you know, centuries of what it is like when the government and, and, and religion are hand in hand. So that is true uh, that, uh, you know, they, they, they set things up in America so that it wouldn't be the way Europe had been for centuries. Um, I don't think it's quite accurate, though, to refer that, that wasn't an atheist movement, though. I mean, the, the founding fathers were not, um, you know, staunch unbelievers. Um, and, you know, Jefferson was deistic. He rejected Christ's divinity, but still believed that Christ was a man and a great moral teacher. So, um, <laughs> And, and, of course, if you, you know, the, the history of Christianity is pretty much the history of Western civilization, so you can't really separate the two. Now, uh, as far as, uh, you know, atheism today being complacent, uh, well, again, I disagree because, um, you know, a show like this wasn't on, you know, even local channels 10 years ago. And uh, you didn't have, like, even when Madeleine O'Hare had you know, was in charge of American atheists and was doing stuff. The organization really wasn't the savvy, you know, political, um, you know, the action group that it is today, right? Um, you know, post-Madeline, it has been a much more uh, focused and I, th and I think positively focused organization. Uh, so I think that in the last decade, but specifically, of course, inspired by, you know, the rise of the Bush administration and you know, the threat of the current religious right to religious liberty, you know, with this whole idea of, <laughs> no, <laughs> our, trust us, theocracy under us would be so much better. Well, no. Um, I think that it, we have seen in the last five years, yeah, and certainly within the last uh, few years, um, uh, much, uh, you know, atheists being much more, I don't want to say aggressive, but not exactly being complacent either. I mean, we just certainly, it, 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 it gets to the point where it's, it's enough is enough, and you know, we want to stand up and say, no, you can't have these monuments in, in government buildings that, you know, favoring one religion over another. That isn't right. You can't, you know, impose prayer upon school children in such a way as to, you know, make the kids who are of a different religion, you know, feel like pariahs in their own school. That isn't right. There has been, I think, a lot more activity, um, you know, uh, uh, involved in fighting that kind of stuff. And that has been making headway. Uh, you know, uh, the, the recent textbook uh, vote, you know, where they, uh, you know, the, the, the school board, it was a big fight, but ultimately the school board decided to actually have the science textbooks with science in them and, and not make these concessions to religious fundamentalists who wanted to weaken the scientific content. So I think that, uh, you know, where the battles are being fought, they're being fought in a very positive way. And, um, you know, uh, and the, the far right, the, the religious right, tries to characterize these, you know, these kinds of fights as being, you know, assaults on the faith. And, but nothing could be further from the truth, all right? These are the people making assaults on the faith because they are the ones dictating that only their faith is the valid one that people should be, you know, undertaking, uh, you know, even other Christians. If you're a Christian but you believe in evolution, then you're a bad Christian, right? I mean, that is the attitude that the real far fundamentalist right wing, um, you know, among Christians in this country are thinking. And, uh, and that is not, you know, the, and that's not religious freedom. That is one very small, very fundamentalist sect of American Christianity trying to dictate for everyone else. And that isn't right. 
So, uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that there has been more complacency lately. Um, <clears throat> there's a long way to go, right? I mean, atheists still, it's not really in our nature to organize. You know, it's very, it's, it's kind of tough to get that, you know, get that group mojo going the way that, you know, again, religious groups can do it because they have churches and they have these established communities and they have these networks all set up and they're all well funded. They're big injections of money directly into them. Atheism still doesn't have that. Secular, you know, secularism and or what have you are just church state separation groups, you know, don't, haven't really got it that strong yet, but it's getting better, right? So, so I, I, I would not be quite so pessimistic. I mean, you, you seem to be feeling very pessimistic about it right now, and I would say you know, there's not really a reason to be. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, my... the, I'd just like to comment that. Yeah, one more, and then we, I, we want to go ahead and go on to the next Yeah, guy. I'd just like to comment that. Yes, okay. That when secular movement mm -hmm. took over power from religious uh, establishments throughout Europe and, and America, they did it in a pretty forceful way. Let me give you two examples in France and in Mexico. Napoleon and Benito Juarez, both of them, took over all of the land that the, the, the churches owned and expropriated it to be part of the nation's ownership, the nation's you know, wealth, uh -huh. meaning the land now belonged to everyone rather than to the church. Okay. They took power from them, and uh, in, in some extreme cases, like in Mexico, a lot of the church uh, officials, clerics, priests, were summarily executed for their abuse of power. Executed. I'm talking executed. Mm -hmm. Secular governments came to power by being extremely aggressive and, of course, being fed up with the abusive uh, <coughs> nature of the church, you know, government. Right. And uh, we now accept the secular governments as, you know, something that's been going on forever. But there is no guarantee that these people are going to inch up. And when I see these battles in court and when I see these people taking over, they are testing the waters to see if they can once again yeah. rule the world like they used to. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's one. And the last the last comment is I read that book on, on the user illusion by Tor Noritrand. Okay. And I, I, I recommend it highly to all atheist people because it's okay. just such a great book. Okay. okay. Yeah. It is Thank a you. fantastic book, The User Illusion. It just uh, it just opens up a lot of uh, new uh, areas in your brain as far as knowledge is concerned. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's it. I'm sorry. I took up. No, it's cool. No, it's interesting right. points, Juan. And we always we always enjoy hearing from you when you call. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. We'll talk Thanks to you. Talk calling. to you later. Bye bye. Yeah. Well, I mean, I certainly don't favor anybody summarily executing anybody. But, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in in, in this democracy, um, you know, uh, devout Christians have every right to run for office and be uh, you know and be out there trying to promote their beliefs and 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 at yeah. least get you know what they're what they consider to be their values out there in the public arena you have that right and uh but if what you're trying to promote is something that will infringe upon the rights of others in an unfair way then you know those who disagree with you in that same sort of democracy yeah. have the right to challenge you and fight you yeah. um so yeah, I mean, I would not advocate any sort of situation where any group simply based upon their beliefs weren't allowed to to advocate yeah. and participate, yeah. but you know, but uh, again, it is it is only the it is only in a secular government that you can really have true religious freedom. Because otherwise, if you have a theocratic system, right, what you have, even if that theocratic system says, "Oh, sure, other religion, you can have your temple or your mosque or your church yeah. or your lodge or what have you," there is still that you know the, that whole notion of my government favors this other belief over mine. Yeah. Making you feel like a second class citizen. We don't and we don't like that in America. Yeah. Okay. Other calls have been holding very patiently and we appreciate that. So Phil is on one. Hi, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to make a few comments and observations. Yes, sir. Uh number one is it seems to me when people throw some seeds out, uh plant some flowers or something, they don't they don't say, I want this seed to be the tallest, I want this seed to be the brightest. Anything like that, and it, you know, I, I, from my observations, I don't think that you know whether completely, regardless of the fact of whether or not there is a God, uh, 
any such entity doesn't seem to me to be taking any kind of an active participation in the way things go on. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they if if they are, then they certainly seem to be neglecting. You know, I mean, this has been pointed out many many times by a whole lots of people yeah. that you know there's a whole lot of pain and suffering going on, and you know uh, um, they're not doing a very good job if they're participating or if or if that's the way. They are participating, then it makes you wonder what their motives are yeah. and just what they're like. Um, and just a few other things. Number one is, I mean, most people remember Galileo. Uh-huh. Does anybody remember the Pope that yeah. opposed Galileo? Good point. Uh, and of course, nowadays, you know, the Pope <laughs> is saying that condoms don't protect people from AIDS, which is a real helpful thing to be propagated. Yeah, yeah thanks, yeah, there, really. And sure. the last thing is that, you know, that most of our, our continuing source of life, you know, comes from the sun. Uh-huh. And the sun functions by thermal nuclear actions. So, you know, every time you torch off a thermal nuclear device, you know, that, that operates on this, you know, fusion, the same principle as the sun. Uh-huh. So this is something for religious people that maybe they should consider that we should torch off all the nukes because every time we do that, we're releasing a spark of life. Uh, and that, look, uh, let, let, let's not give them too many ideas. Please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are some, uh, some people off in some horrible little hovel somewhere might actually take you up on that. But, uh, but the, uh, yeah, interesting uh, little paradox, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Hey, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Collins. Interesting. Um, hmm. Technically, though, what we do when we have atom bombs and you know nuclear bombs, stuff like that, it's not like what they have in the sun. Uh, what we have is very heavy yeah. molecule that we split apart, and that releases energy in the sun. They're actually pushing them together. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a bit, yeah. A bit picky. Okay. But, uh, but they're both damn hot. Yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't want to be like <laughs> anywhere. Those mess you up real bad. Anywhere too close. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Um, so, well, you know, so, I mean, people did used to worship the sun. Right? Yeah. Because it was the, the source of life. That yeah. was God, you know. Uh, well, the sun was... Yeah. Was Apollo riding his chariot across the sky? Was he the, I believe so. I'm it was Apollo, right? Yeah. Okay. And of course, and of course, the Egyptians with yeah, Amun Ra and all the yeah. rest of it. That was the sun. Okay. Uh, Bill has been holding a very patient, long time. Hi. Thanks for holding. <laughs> Tell that guy. Wow. Okay. Who's Jeez. next? God. How long did he wait just to do that, <laughs> dude? You don't get it. You don't hurt us. It doesn't hurt us. <laughs> yeah. It, you're hurting your own butt by sitting on the couch for 20 minutes on hold. Whatever. Okay. We have some other folk. <laughs> another folk lined up and waiting. It's like... So, okay. Well, I could do two of the humorous stories. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, these were two that didn't know how to do them. Not kind of on the humorous side. Uh, let's see. First, we'll go with this one. A German vicar inadvertently supplied his parish with dozens of hardcore porn films <laughs> in an unsuccessful bid Oops. to teach people about the life of Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm sure there was a lot of that going on. Uh, uh, a vicar in the southwestern town of, I'm not even going to try and pronounce these. They're, they're really strange spellings. Okay. Uh, had ordered 300 copies of a video film portraying the life of Christ as told by the gospel according to Luke. Oh, dear. Um, and the first batch of 20 or 30 videos were distributed, and we immediately got a reaction from five to seven people. <laughs> 20 or 30 videos got out. Uh huh. Five to seven people complained. Okay. Um, <laughs> about it being porn. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I just need end. to watch it a few more times. Just, so I just can have a couple a, more times. Just so I can understand exactly how <laughs> sinful it is. It's, ooh, yes. <laughs> uh, undaunted, uh, Scheiswig said he was pressing ahead with a Life of Christ video campaign. It's extremely successful. Uh, of, I, 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 it, would it is. Yes. You start distributing porn as a life of Christ, and yeah, people. So, so what these on. things? So it was. It was like some manufacturing accident. Uh, but he yes. distributed them. In, but well, he yes. found out later. Yes, it, they, well, they, they sent re- the video off to just off to the distributor who made copies of it and distributed, it, and they accidentally got the tapes mixed up or something like that. Oh, distributed the wrong tapes. So it's not Ooh. their fault. They just, you know, they yeah. kind of had to scramble after and say, oops, sorry. Yeah. So, so they, 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 they fixed the goof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They recall, they got back all the videos and uh, said, okay, we'll get new ones. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> can I keep the old one too? <laughs> just so I can have a, a full understanding of the depths of depravity and sin to which humanity can descend. Yeah, oh, exactly. Mama. Oh, mama. 
Yeah. So, yeah, we must watch the funny. porn and then watch the life of Christ. Yeah, that's just one of those, you know, things that you just you don't really think happens. It's yeah. you know, it's like some <laughs> Saturday night live sketch or something. Too come funny come to, to life. Yeah. 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 But oh well. So, <laughs> so and hmm. uh, the other one's short too. Why not? Mm-hmm. Uh, this one is a priest. Uh, a part-time priest was charged with making obscene phone calls to a 70-year-old uh, Ormond Beach woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stanley, 60, okay. is 60, uh, who worked as a helper priest in several Catholic churches in the Diocese of or- Orlando, said he was unaware of any charges and that the calls were made as a joke and that he was under the influence of medication. <laughs> Um, I have done nothing to her. Uh, it was on the phone. Uh, I apologize <laughs> if I use bad language. Okay, so what kind of medication out there is there? That's a little label on the bottle that says, Caution, side <laughs> effects may include... Do not operate telephonic com- communication devices while under the influence Calling of up 70-year-old ladies and being obscene. Exactly. <laughs> if you think that this is a problem for you, <laughs> consult your physician before taking this medication. Uh. Uh, diocese <laughs> spokeswoman uh, said said his faculties were removed. Uh, facil- Sounds like his faculties were removed. <laughs> faculties. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, they were. Uh, were removed by blah blah blah, and that he asked to be, and that he was asked to leave the diocese by November fourteenth. Well, where's his problem? I mean, who would take a drug called blah blah blah? Yeah. I mean, you do that, <laughs> that's, you're asking for it right there. But we can't make him leave. Oh, I see. So the diocese is saying, you know, yeah, we asked him to, but we can't make him. Yeah, so, it's not like, like he molested anybody. I know exactly. It's just phone stuff. It's just yeah. phone sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, those are good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yep. Oh my! Well, I tell you, maybe just had it. Did he even know this woman? Or you know, uh, I don't know. I doubt it. Maybe she's been, I, mean, I mean, to a certain extent, it kind of sounds like they might have had a little familiarity. Yeah, like she'd been putting pocket lint into the you know collection plate all these years, and he finally just had enough. And <laughs> let her have it. All right. Okay, call from Coleman on line two. Hi, you're on the air. How's it going? Uh, it's doing pretty good. How you doing? We're all right. What's up? Okay, so um, first time caller. Mm-hmm. And um, so I have a question about, okay, so you're atheist, so you don't take belief in a personal God, um, which I can understand, you know, man-like figure sitting on a throne. Oh. Um, it's kind of oh. hard to... Well, I don't even, I mean, no. you know, any kind of... Um, but my, my, my question okay. is that, okay, so you don't take belief in a personal God, so how is it that... From an atheist point of view, you explain uh, the forces behind and giving way to, to universal and spiritual creation. Well, I don't. I would have to yep. understood what you meant by universal and spiritual creation first. Well, I mean, you know, the the, the creation of yeah. uh, mankind. Uh, right. I mean, if you're, you if you're just the, talking, if you're just the asking, different kingdoms, the mineral kingdoms, you're, planets. You're kind of hedging. You're yeah. kind of hedging your bets there by saying, you know, how do you explain the creation of mankind? Ass- you know, that's okay, obviously that's assuming being, that there was a creation. Of it. Hmm. So, well, it's it's. Uh, I'll just address the question this way. Uh, you know, if if there were a, a creative force for all those things, like a god, right? What would have created that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if things if things have to be created, then why would God be any exempt? Any more exempt? Um, uh, you know the 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 the, the underlying uh, the argument behind uh, what's what's called the first cause argument basically goes like this: It's like uh, okay, you know things exist, and um, but things that exist has they they all have to have a cause. You know the things have to be caused to exist, and that cause has to be something other than itself. And so if you work your way back um, to you know what caused this, and then what caused the thing before it, going all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Well, perhaps there was a thing that was the first cause. It was the uncaused cause, and it caused everything after that. Well, but the problem there is, well, you know, why just assume that that was an uncaused cause? And if you're willing to accept the whole notion that anything that exists could have been uncaused, then why not just apply that to the universe itself, which is all that we know exists, right? I mean, we don't know that there is anything outside the universe that exists. So anything that might be outside the universe that exists is purely speculation and cannot really be discussed any more seriously than that in terms of, you know, trying to ask why are we here and why is there stuff? Hmm. So, um, you know, so to, to cut a long story short, you know, the... Um, we understand that there are forces in nature that just work the way they work. 
you know, uh, quantum physics tells us that, in fact, on on the micro level, you know, on the submolecular, subatomic level, uh, events happen that are not the result of causation all the time. So, you know, if there was a universe at some point, and uh, if there was a Big Bang, and prior to the Big Bang, the universe was a singularity, a very small subatomic uh, entity, right. and some quantum event happened, and uh, it caused that thing to expand to where it was, then that got a universe here. And then in terms of why are there stars, why are there planets, well, then that had to come with the development of, of uh, you know, uh, gravitational forces and various other physical forces causing those things. And, and it is a massive field of study. Uh, sure. And there's and, not really and, one easy answer to it all, but, uh, okay. but we're still learning. We don't know exactly. We right, don't know, right. ultimately. You don't know, but I mean, do you at least recognize that there's a massive amount of intelligence that is working through the universe? And through well, I don't really know. No. Why would I recognize that? I mean, what would be the evidence of that? I would need evidence, evidence that there. Um, I would need evidence that there's intelligence throughout the entire universe to recognize it. I beg your pardon. I would need. I would need evidence that there is a massive amount of intelligence throughout the entire universe, as you put it, in order to recognize that as a fact. I would need evidence. Well, I'm for just that talking in- about you know the laws of nature. Are highly intelligent, highly organized. Well, they're they're organized, oh, but they're organized, but they're not necessarily the results of intelligence, right? I mean, things. I mean, order is just part of the I nature. I would say of the, they're more the ex- expression of intelligence rather yeah. than the result. I mean, well, you have to understand that order is just all part of the nature of things existing at all, right? I mean, in order for something to exist, right, it's gotta it's gotta be something. I mean, if it's if something's gonna exist, it has to be a thing. You know, it sure. has to take some kind of form. Otherwise, it's just loose molecules floating around. It might not even be that. And so you wouldn't have a state of any sort of things existing that you could identify and say, well, oh, there's an asteroid. Loose molecules exist nonetheless. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, and even, for, well. even for those molecules to exist, for those, for those molecules to exist, they have to, just, they have to be ordered. And so ordered is just, in t- uh, that's, it's a thing called the law of identity. You know, that things are what they are, right? And uh, that's not, and... In order to exist at all, you have to at least have some sort of degree of order. And there, there's a big difference between order and design. Design implies some sort of purpose, okay, that a designer said, I'm going to design this thing, and I'm going to make it do this thing because I have a reason for it. Okay, so and if, do, if you... Do, if you, not, do you not recognize that? No, I don't recognize no. that because I don't, uh, because I don't have any evidence for the thing that did the, for the entity that did the designing or what the purpose might have been. Okay. You know, all, what I know is that, you know, things take ordered form because they have to. Probably. You know, sure. I, you either have order or you have a state of non-existence. So hmm. for things to exist at all, they have to be ordered. So order itself does not, you know, it does not in and of itself prove that there is an intelligent purpose behind that order. I see. Okay. Interesting. Well, hey, thank yeah. you. I just right. wanted to... Um, well, chew on that and, and, yeah. and come back at us later on with some more stuff. Cool. All right. Adios. Appreciate Thanks, it. Sean. Okay, cool. Uh, interesting call. So, if that all sounds, if that all sounded kind of long-winded and confusing, just um, let me, let me ex- ex- uh, try to, you know, explain a little bit more concrete terms, okay? I mean, we as human beings are creative yeah. beings, right? I mean, we make stuff to do so. We have this coffee cup and we made it to do a thing, yeah. which is hold a drink for us to drink out of, you know, and... Stuff like that. So if you're going to look at things like you're just items in nature, blades of grass, yeah. okay, like why is a blade of grass the shape it is? Okay, you can either say, well, you know, this is how this sort of, um, you know, botanical, biological living thing, you know, just the, this is how it develops into yeah. itself because of, you know, the way it yeah. derives, you know, the nutrients from the ground and what have you, and you can go into all the sort of scientific explanations, what have you. Or you can say something like, oh, well, you know, God made grass. And so at that point, you have to explain, well, then what's the purpose of grass? Yeah. Okay, I mean, why, what was the, what was the intent saying, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this stuff, right? And it's going to be green, and it's going to be real, they're going to be real thin strands of it, about like this long or so, and they grow, okay? <laughs> and this is going to be all over the ground, on this planet, yeah. that but cert, only certain types of ground, yeah. okay, and 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 my reason for my reason for grass, as opposed to okay, the reason to have grass here and weeds here and just dirt here, okay. See now you have to under, you, you now have to yeah. explain what the reasoning all is. Yeah. You're just and you're adding this new level of mystery to this whole question of existence. Yeah. You know, again, it's people looking at the universe, and because we are creative design-oriented yeah. things. Yeah. That's just how we kind of think. Yeah. It's a natural 
extrapolation. But, you know, all you're doing is adding another mystery because when you say, oh, there's got to be this intelligent designer behind it, well, now you have to say, okay, well, then what was the motive yeah. behind the intelligent designer making, you know, weeds and parasites and blood-sucking insects? And, and again, you could tell, stuff. again, yeah. that design versus order thing. But uh-huh. again, going back to the coffee cup you mentioned, you, ha- you have this item here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's made up, you know, you've got so much stuff here that we had to mold together to get this coffee cup. Mm-hmm. And it holds, you know, a fair amount of liquid in it, a fair amount of water. So... It's a fairly efficient design. Not mm-hmm. the best in the world, but it's not that bad either. Right. Versus, now this is design. Um, order is, let's say, the planet. You have, you know, mm-hmm. how many billions and trillions of tons of material that you had to get together to form a mm-hmm. planet? How long did it have to incubate mm-hmm. to get, you know, the right kind of, you know, atmosphere and everything so that, you know, these little tiny people could live on it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, inhabit just the scratching the surface of it. Um, I mean, again, the planet is, an ef- is, is highly inefficient. Uh, um, you can have much better designs. You know, I mean, again, yeah. we're talking God here. He can do right. anything he wants. Oh, right. Yeah, you're talking about, like, he's, there's so much wasted space in the solar exactly. system. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. In the solar system and the planet itself. Yeah. Why can't we have corridors right down to the center of the planet? Well, certainly would, you know, so. um, help in terms of, you know, yeah, more land area. To more live closet on. space. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's real important. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it's, that's a very important design entity. Again, you know, if I mean, you haven't got good closet our, space. Our universe has pretty poor design. Yeah. Look how much of it is unused. See, that's what you need to do, right? I mean, just a universe, you always make, if you're going to create a universe, you have to have like massive walk-in closets exactly. in your universe <laughs> all over the place so that all of the inhabitants of your universe your place to store your stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Again, it's it's uh, you know design implies a purpose above and beyond just like being a particular shape or yeah. looking like a thing, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, three. Uh, hi, you're on. Hey, you're on the air, Craig. Yes, hello. Hi, thanks for holding. I'm a frequent listener and uh, really am enjoying your show. I've heard so many people call in though about this issue of uh, of creation. Yes. But I wanted to refer you to a wonderful source. I don't know if you know who Ad- Adolf Grunbaum is. But Adolf Grunbaum is the Andrew Mellon Chair of the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, Greenbaum? Grunbaum, G-R-U-N-B-A-U-M. G-R-U-N. Dr. Grunbaum has written several papers on physical cosmology. Okay. One of them is called The the Pseudo-Problem of Creation in Physical Cosmology. Okay. And what he... uh, Excuse me, I sometimes get talking so fast I have to slow down and breathe a little bit. That's but fine. anyway, uh, Dr. Grunbaum has dealt with the uh, the issue of creation ex nihilo, okay. creation out of nothing. Uh-huh. And uh, he traces the origins of this idea back to the ancient Hebrews and Genesis and maybe beyond. Okay. But uh, the real prejudice, the real bias here, the real, the real outstanding presumption that's made by creationists is that the default state of the universe is nothingness. And uh, there isn't really anything... And anything we know about creative processes or transformation of matter and energy yep. to imply that nothing that is the default state mm-hmm. All right. and that uh, <clears throat> that uh, yeah. maybe this is really a, a, a pseudo problem, a non problem, a problem that people are always trying to solve when they say, well, everything has to have come from someplace and, it, and you know it just popped into existence magically. It's kind of like the Gary Larson cartoon, you know, and then a miracle occurred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Hmm. It, again, the, the common idea is you look out at a field and there's nothing there, and then 10 years later, oh, my God, there's a big tree now. That wasn't there before. How did it get there? It just, you know, kind of appeared. Well, no, it didn't. There was a seed there. It took all the nutrients from the ground, took a lot of sunlight, took a lot of air, mm-hmm. put all the stuff together in the right way, and they got a tree. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, there was definitely the stuff there. It just had to be rearranged to make a tree. Right. We take wood and we rearrange it to make a, you know, a table and a chair. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're looking at that tree in out in the field, right, and and you and you are someone arguing for the whole notion of a purposive designer, then you have to say, okay, mm-hmm. well then, what is the purpose of that tree out in the field that the designer had in mind? Or mm-hmm. God, let's call it. Let's stop using a designer because well, we all know what everyone uh, means, right? Uh, so uh, say, is this. Yeah. Is this uh, an, art, an art project by God? Yeah. But, is that, this, is but that's this, a separate argument, though, yeah. is the design and the purpose of it. Right. It, uh, what but I was tying it back into our earlier is, is color, where, Yeah, but yeah. where does this stuff actually come from? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, it's probably. always been there. And so, again, people kind of assume that, well, the tree got there and there was nothing there. And, uh, you know, a mm-hmm. table is here and it wasn't here before. Mm-hmm. So the universe is here. You know, apparently there was nothing here before. Well, not quite right. Oh, Everything right. was here. We're rearranging stuff. 
Yeah. And so maybe the universe is just rearranging stuff that's always been there, and we just can't see farther back than you know twelve billion right. years or whatever. Yeah. Well, and one of his other papers, Dr. Greenbaum, even uh, even postulated the possibility that the universe was here and crunched and then came back, and you exactly. know was, was you know. The, the universe could be created out of the leftover material from other universes yeah. or, or energy. But anyway, we don't know that because that goes back beyond the singularities, back beyond the, the areas that we actually can get back to. I think you mentioned once before that the universe at one point that we actually can get back to maybe with, with our calculations is something the size of a grapefruit. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that article to you. It is available online. Okay. If you go to okay. www.pit.fu, you can probably navigate your way around through Adolf Grunbaum and find that article. It is Pit.edu? Yes. Okay. It is the uh, the pseudo problem of creation in physical cosmology. Okay, I'll just do a search for his name. I'm sure it'll pop up. Yeah, yeah so you, you, can, you can get it. Yeah. yeah, I've heard of that before, and yeah, okay. I just haven't looked into it further. So yeah, well, we Thank pr- you. we appreciate the tip. We really do. Sure thing. Thanks okay. for your time. Okay. Thank you for, for calling. Sure thing. Interesting. Yeah, that's so funny. Uh, okay. All right. Hi, right, you're on the air. Yeah, I was. I have a few comments. Um, yes. First of all, what do you write down on your pen on that paper? I just make notes of what people are saying so All that right. I can feed back. Well, and Ashley looks like that superstar from wrestling, Goldberg. Oh, I have heard that so many times. I wish I could find a picture of this guy. Re- I don't like, know like, the can name. you turn your head to a side real quick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, and that looks like a Stone Cold. Heavyweight champion of the world. On, uh, Does on he look like Stone Cold? I thought he looked like Stone Cold. Uh, not oh, no, he looks like quite. Goldberg, the heavyweight champion. Oh, okay. I'll have to look And my other All question right. is about evolution. What y'all think about it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's pretty much uh, you know what the what what the scientists tell us is uh, you know, it's got all the best evidence behind it. So, um, you know, if you're interested in it, there's all kind of like there's that website down there, and there's all kind of explanations as to what it says and what it doesn't say, and what we know and what we don't know. You know, there's a lot there's a there's a lot of stuff we know, and there's a lot of stuff we don't know about. You know, how living things went from you know little microbes to what we are today, and and there's a lot of stuff that they're still trying to figure out, but. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a real complex uh, subject, but most scientists will tell you that uh, you know the evidence behind it is pretty solid. <coughs> mm. So, all right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Rick, <laughs> how can okay? Ah, okay. Hi, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Yes. Um, as atheists, um, and if to you God does not exist, uh, then how? Can you, as atheist, say that um, whenever something bad happens, uh, how can you assume a God that should be just when someone dies unjustly? As often you claim on your show that um, if something bad happens, uh, or how can there be a God if he would allow war and torment right. and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's a problem that, um, well, the, the Christian God has uh, and, and that Christians have. It's called the problem of evil, right? Um, it's, and it's a big criticism <clears throat> having to do with the God of Christianity the way Christians describe him, right? Which is he's supposed to be omniscient. He's supposed to know everything. He's supposed to be omnipotent, which means he can do anything. He's got no limits to his power. And finally, he's supposed to be omnibenevolent, which means he's this being of unconditional love and uh, loves us all equally. And presumably, if he did, then he wouldn't want people to get hurt because that would be what the way a loving being would be, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so the whole, the whole, what the problem of evil basically says is that, well, evil exists. Bad stuff happens, and it happens to good people who don't deserve it. And it doesn't seem to uh, be uh, reasonable to think that uh, if, if, uh, the real situation were that there was this omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God watching over us all, that, that he would be allowing these things to happen. Well, coming, so, uh, excuse me, Martin, yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that coming from the Christian or these other religious points of view, uh-huh. uh, yeah, they make this God uh, out to be this perfect God, mm-hmm. that, uh, and to you atheists and maybe to others it seems like well why would there be this god that would allow this kind of uh, uh evil or this corruption or this injustice to happen mm-hmm. and as atheists I, i'm just trying to understand well how can you make an assumption about what god may be as far as like 
him allowing are you saying that this God, yeah. yeah are you saying maybe God has you know a purpose that you know we don't see it just yet but you know ultimately it'll turn out better type thing I'm not a believer in God and I'm yeah. not an I, atheist I, yeah I think I think I know I think I know what you're asking we try not the only when we as atheists criticize a certain notion of God right uh, the only thing that we can work with is the definition that believers give us right so if we bring up the problem of evil uh, it's a response to a specific definition of God that believers give us. Okay, we don't make we don't believe in God, right? So we don't have any vested interest in assuming like one type of a God over another type of a God. You know, we that's not really our position to sort of like let's start by assuming what a God would be, and then let's see whether or not that works for us. We can uh, since it's believers who are out there saying, look, you guys are in the wrong. You need to be believing in our God because we're like, okay, we'll define your God for us, and then. All we can do is respond to the definition that we get. And if the definition doesn't make sense, then we point out how it doesn't make sense. So that's really all we're doing. We're not really, you know, I, you know, presumptuously or otherwise trying to say, this is, this is the only way that a God can be. And, and, and if a God isn't, in, you know, this, because, you know, there could very well uh, be a God who you know, doesn't care about you know, hurt or injustice or, or war or anguish in the world, right? And there are people who believe in that kind of God. Those people are called deists, okay? Now, deists avoid the problem of evil completely because they believe that there's, that if a God exists, he created the universe, and then once it was done, he went, okay, fine, and, and is off doing other stuff now, and he's not involved. That's the deistic definition of God. Now, I have criticisms of the deistic God, but they aren't those, okay? They're, they're from an entirely different angle. So, but... If we're going to give a, a criticism of a, God, of a notion of God or why it is that we don't believe in a certain God, we can only work with what we get from a believer. We're not the ones trying to make assumptions about what that God would be. I'd like to uh, give you some information against the, against, uh, the so-called reality in Jesus Christ, okay. and that is that uh, there have been many so-called Jesus of Christ that have existed throughout time right. immemorial before Christ, as a matter of fact, uh, for thousands of years, uh, starting even before Buddha and Krishna, there's been, there have been dozens of claims of a Christ figure that existed throughout time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all had Virgin Marys. They all die, uh, died in a crucifixion yeah, yeah. type of way. Yeah. Or just and, uh, and you could do a good service uh, to your cause, mm -hmm. if if you want to call it that or not, uh, your a cause uh, by watching Jeff Contreras. Therefore, I am who's got all through uh, December a series on Christ, uh, the greatest lie ever told. And and what where's this showing? It's. The name of his show is Therefore I Am. Right. It's on Tuesday. It's on Tuesday evenings, uh, I believe, from 10 to 11 p.m. Okay. Is it on? What channel is it on? Uh, I think it's on Channel 10 okay. Access Television. Okay. Well, we'll have some of our, our folks. I actually don't have my digital cable anymore, but I'm sure some of our folks will watch it and, yeah. and, and have an opinion on it. And but you talked about four different versions of uh -huh. uh, in the in the past, on some of your shows, you talked about four different versions mm -hmm. uh, that people gave about uh, Christ's uh, mm -hmm. birth mm -hmm. or and resurrection. Uh, you, what Jeff Contreras talks about goes way beyond that in disproving okay. uh, the existence of Christ. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Well, thanks a lot for the tip. Thank you, Bastard. You know, thank you, Bastard. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, Matt. So, well, let's see. Let's see take Matt or Steve. We can probably get them both in. Uh, Matt, hi. You're on the air. Hey, guys. What's up? Uh, just you? hanging. Yeah, um, I was going to talk to you about you guys specifically don't believe in Jesus Christ, right? Or is it just any any kind of God? We don't believe in deities in general, right? Just okay. gods. You know, there may have been a person named Jesus Christ. If there was, I don't believe it was divine, but right. we don't believe in gods. Right. Well, I was going to say that um, I think that we ourselves are proof of higher intelligence, and I don't want to freak you guys out with any. Well, I don't know about uh, some of our callers today, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. But yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, the the way it works, it seems to me that we are kind of proof through evolution 
that there could be something that is um, has a a bigger mind than us that can um, you know do different things with their mind because as you guys know it's all about mind over matter. You you design something in your head and you can write it down and then you can turn it into a building or a, a car or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, what I'm getting at is we might be um, a big experiment. You know, there might be, like that guy said before, um, there wasn't ever nothingness. Uh-huh. There's never been nothingness. Uh-huh. It's all just energy. It's all just stars that are that are burning out and being recreated. And um, you know, the matter is always there. Right. Yeah, and the energy um, can neither be created nor destroyed. So this stuff's just been happening forever, and it's going to happen forever. Uh-huh. And there is no beginning and no end. But I really do think that, um, you know, the science that we've got now, that we ourselves as, you know, just these little apes on this planet are, are getting away with, with all the genetic um, engineering that they're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. They're capable of making, you know, chickens that can bark if they want to, and they're cloning <laughs> things, and they're doing, they're, they're doing stuff. I mean, I'm not a Raelian or anything like that, but I don't really think that, because the science that's coming out now is like, science fiction stuff that you and I know was going on yeah. in movies and stuff during the 80s that we saw you know they're they're yeah. implementing that even with you know domestic matters all the cameras everywhere and I you know mm-hmm. it's just getting yeah well um, I think we've kind of strayed from the original question but yeah getting getting back, getting back to the whole notion of like uh, what might have yeah yeah there look there may have been some sort of cre- you know creative intelligence behind it all there may have been right I mean every yeah. Uh, right now, though, I mean, just uh, due to the lack of any kind of specific evidence that direction, the best it is, uh, the best you can say about it is that that's speculative. Just like altern- alternate universes are speculative and just like a whole lot of other concepts, you know, in, you know, um, that human beings come up with, whether they're philosophical or scientific, are speculative. But right now, the only thing we can do is work with the knowledge that we do have. And if people want to ask questions like, well, what, you know, what was there before the universe and, uh, what have you, you know, you kind of have to say at a certain point, we still don't know the answer to a lot of things. There's more that we don't know than what we do know. That's right. Yeah. But but we're working on it. And that's that's what makes it all Well, exciting. that's what science is. And everything's right. magic until you can prove it. And I've been <laughs> approached by the Freemasons to join them. Mm. There's ancient knowledge. That's what your last caller was referring to, um, the Esoteric Roundtable, the show that's on ACTV with Jeff, Jeff Contreras. Mm-hmm. They talk about... Um, magic and stuff, and yeah. you know, psychic powers, and and you know, yeah. just stuff that's. Yeah, well, we're not we're not sure that uh, you know. I mean, we we would not necessarily believe in those claims, even if they're paranormal in nature. Yeah. But but you know, there's uh, you know, there's there is a lot about the universe and about the the reality that we live in that we still have yet to discover, and um, you know, that's why it's a it's an exciting ongoing project. And but look, we're out of time, man. We appreciate your call. Okay, thanks, man. Take care. Thanks. All right. Uh, um. You know, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask Steve, who is holding on line three, to send that in, in, in a viewer email, because we are just flat out of time. We're down to like the last minute and a half of the show, and we just don't have time to do you justice, okay? So that viewer email address to write us, okay, is tv at atheistcommunity.org. Atheist hyphen. Atheist hyphen community.org. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, tv at atheist hyphen community.org. That's a viewer feedback email address. We, we answer all the letters we get, every single one. Um, you know, good ones, we bring them on the show, we read them. Out loud, and uh, you know, I, I still am way behind in updating the online page of emails. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. I can get around to it sooner or later. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that's uh, you can stick a fork in us. We are done again for today. Um, another Sunday. We are here every Sunday, four thirty p.m. And uh, are the reruns back on yet? The replay uh, shows. I believe that they are. Yes. Yeah, the replay shows. We have uh, reruns on uh, Tuesdays at four thirty p.m. Uh, here on Channel Ten, uh, Atheist Experience, and. Uh, just, uh, again, if you want to some more, uh, you know, or, origins questions, people who uh, called up and, you know, want to talk seriously about that, uh, talkorigins.org right up there at the uh, uh, top of that list uh, has to do with um, uh, the evolutionary uh, questions. And then the one that was right under that, skeptic.com, skeptics okay. dictionary is, uh, you know, if you want to talk about esoteric beliefs and, uh, you yeah. know, psychic p- phenomenon. Yeah, that's a good site for that. That sort of thing. That, uh, that, that pretty much gives a skeptical uh, point of view on those uh, attitudes as well. 
Uh, but listen, hey, we appreciate all of our, uh, you know, our viewers and our callers. Uh, another one bites the dust. Uh, had a great time on a beautiful Sunday, so go out and enjoy the rest of the Sunday. Ashley, thank you again thank you. for excellent work. And um, so until next time, take care, theists. We don't hate you. We, we just, just think, think you're, you're wrong. wrong. Everybody have a good weekend. Yes. And congratulations on getting old Saddam. Yeah, yes. All right. Bye.